Welcome to the Volcano Academy and a discussion on the use of intravascular ultrasound in coronary intervention involving diffuse disease. I'm Al Ambrosia, interventional cardiologist and director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory at Banner Heart Hospital in Mesa, Arizona. What I'd like to touch on in this presentation is why I use intravascular ultrasound in diffuse disease discuss two clinical studies related to the use of intravascular ultrasound in diffuse disease, discuss the workflow that we've developed at Banner Heart Hospital to simplify our use of intravascular ultrasound, and to take you through a case in which I used intravascular ultrasound to treat a patient with a diffusely diseased LED. Why I use intravascular ultrasound in diffuse disease. Assessing diffusely diseased vessel as angiographically is much more difficult due to lack of normal uh, reference vessel, either proximal or distally. Uh, in addition, the outcomes from stenting in diffusely diseased vessels are uh, not as good as with focal lesions, and most clinical trials exclude lesions greater than 30 millimeters of length. In addition, geographic miss is much more common in diffusely diseased vessels, as the most severe lesion is stented. However, typically the proximal uh, and or distal portion of the stent will be placed in a disease segment and although it may look good angiographically, uh, functionally it is still significant. I've come to realize this is much more common uh, since I began using FFR and IFR guidance for evaluating diffusely diseased vessels in which I have stented the most significant lesion and have realized that my post-procedure IFR or FFR readings are much lower than I would have predicted, which has prompted me to use intravascular ultrasound and typically I've detected a lesion either proximal or distal to the stent. Lastly, the group of patients that have had previous surgical or percutaneous revascularization are angiographically more challenging and have a higher rate of repeat revascularization and MACE and optimization of their results uh, is essential. Next I'd like to touch on two clinical studies on the use of IVIS in diffuse disease. The first study published in Jack Interventions in 2013 was a study of 543 patients who were randomized to angiographic or IVIS guided intervention. The results of the study showed a 51 percent reduction in MACE rate at two years in patients with stents greater than 28 millimeters when IVIS was used to guide intervention versus angiogram guidance alone. And this was a reduction from 8.1 percent to 4.0 percent. The second study is a registry study that was also published in 2013 in the American Journal of Cardiology, and it was a registry of 3,244 patients in which they looked at MACE rates based on angiogram versus IVIS-guided interventions. They looked at lesions treated with one or more stents with a total length of less than 23 millimeters, 23 to 32 millimeters, or greater than 33 millimeters in length. And what they found was IVIS guidance was associated with a 61% reduction in MACE rates in the lesions covered by greater than 33 millimeters of stent with a reduction in MACE rate from 5.7% to 2.2%. And this was statistically significant. Interestingly, they also found a statistical significant difference in those patients treated with stent lengths between 23 and 32 millimeters. Next I'd like to talk about the workflow that we've developed at Banner Heart Hospital to assist us in using intravascular ultrasound in our coronary interventions. What we realized after talking to several of our interventionalists was that there was real variability in the application of IVIS as well as the workflow that physicians used in order to obtain IVIS images and how they used the images to make decisions in the cath lab when performing intervention. So we developed an algorithm that we use in the cath lab and we empowered our RTs who generally run our IVIS console while we're doing a pullback 
to use the bookmark feature in a consistent way so that we obtained images that we could use to make decisions during intervention. So we have the RT bookmark a distal reference, the Titus lesion at the area of interest as well as a proximal reference, and any images that show significant calcification or dissections. Each time that we make a bookmark of the IVUS image, we do a short record fluoro or cine run. So we have a co-registered image of our IVUS catheter on our working view where the bookmark was obtained. This allows us to rapidly evaluate our IVUS runs and make our clinical decisions. With this protocol in place, it has been much easier to obtain the images and to move into the algorithm that we developed shown on this slide. So prior to stenting, we do a pre-stent IVUS evaluation and assess for any calcium, especially calcium that subtends greater than 180 degrees of the vessel. This allows us to decide whether predilation is necessary or whether plaque modification would be beneficial prior to stent placement. We then use our IVUS data to choose our stents based upon the distal reference diameter and we try to choose a length that will land us in a portion of the proximal vessel that has less than 50 percent plaque burden. Once we've deployed our stents we do a repeat IVUS run to assess the distal stent edge, the minimum stent area, and the proximal stent edge, and we often use ChromaFlow if we have adequate stent expansion and no edge effects and a minimum stent area greater than six millimeters then our assessment is adequate and we perform a completion angiogram. If our stent expansion is not adequate we will then post dilate with a non-compliant balloon and perform a repeat evaluation. We have posted on our IVUS machines nominal stent areas for 2.5, 2.75, 3.0 and 3.5 millimeter stents Next, I'd like to present a challenging case in which intravascular ultrasound was critical to making decisions on intervention. The patient is a 75-year-old female with known coronary artery disease who had a three-vessel bypass in 2006 with hypertension and dyslipidemia. She'd had a previous coronary intervention in 2008 to an obtuse marginal branch and had a known occluded vein graft to the obtuse marginal branch at that time. She began having chest pain about four months prior to presenting while she uh, was attending her granddaughter's graduation. Her symptoms progressed from exertional pain four months ago to three episodes of chest pain that occurred at rest, which each lasted about three minutes and resolved after a single sublingual nitroglycerin. She did have one episode that awoke her from sleep at night. She was placed on increasing dose of beta blocker and had some improvement in her symptoms, but her symptoms persisted with exertion. She was on low-dose beta blockade, aspirin, low sartan hydrochlorothiazide, and PRN nitroglycerin. On exam, her blood pressure was 140 over 80, heart rate 62, rest rate 16, and her oxygen saturations were normal on room air. Her physical exam was negative except for her healed sternotomy scar, and her EKG was nonspecific. She had an echocardiogram that showed normal ejection fraction with mild valvular disease, and she underwent a LexaScan nuclear perfusion study that showed normal ejection fraction with severe anterior apical and anterolateral ischemia. She underwent angiography, and images of her left coronary system showed her left main to have no significant disease. Her LAD appeared to be diffusely diseased in this RAO view, and in the circumflex, there appeared to be a stent in the first obvious marginal branch with a greater than 90% stenosis distal to the stent. In an LAO view of the left system, the diffusely diseased LED is still evident. The left main has very mild disease, and the stenosis in the obtuse marginal branch appears more significant. In the AP caudal view, the obtuse marginal branch stenosis is somewhat better visualized. The left main coronary artery um, appears free of any significant stenosis, and the LAD appears to be occluded at the insertion of the uh, internal mammary artery graft. 
injection of the left ventral mammary artery shows it to be small but patent and it inserts into the mid LED but it appears to supply only a very short segment of the LED before a more proximal and distal occlusion the distal LED is very poorly visualized injection of the native right coronary shows it to be occluded after the shepherd's crook injection of the vein graft to the right coronary shows it to be widely patent with insertion into the posterior descending artery the posterior descending artery distally appears to be diffusely diseased as does a small posterior lateral branch based on the angiograms of the left system it was unclear whether the LED was amenable to intervention and decision was made to perform intravascular ultrasound of the LED if possible. A supportive guide was inserted and interestingly a run-through wire passed very easily into the distal LED. Intravascular ultrasound images were then obtained and are shown here. The distal LED appeared to be larger caliber than suspected and the IVUS images showed three areas of severe stenosis of greater than 70 percent one distal to the mammary insertion site and two more proximally with mixed fibrous and calcified plaque throughout the LED. Next I'd like to look at our IVUS data in a little more detail. In this slide you can see our co-registration uh, angiogram with our IVUS probe in the proximal LED and the still frame that corresponds with our bookmark in the proximal LED. Uh, this shows that the proximal LED is a nearly 3 millimeter vessel that has concentric plaque with a significant stenosis. In the mid vessel, there is also a concentric fibrotic plaque uh, with again the LED being about a 3 millimeter vessel, uh, but a highly significant uh, stenosis is seen. In the distal LED, the IVUS shows that the LED is greater than a 2 millimeter vessel and probably close to a 2.5 millimeter vessel and there is mixed fibrous and calcified plaque distally with a severe stenosis with the residual lumen barely allowing the IVUS probe to pass. This confirms that the vessel is large enough to perform intervention even in the distal vessel. Since the LED was amenable to intervention and the nuclear perfusion study showed ischemia in both the anterior apical and anterolateral wall. Decision was made to treat the obtuse marginal branch and LED. To treat the obtuse marginal branch, a run-through wire was advanced across the lesion. It was dilated with a 2.5 millimeter balloon and a 2.5 by 18 millimeter resolute stent was deployed at 14 atmospheres with excellent angiographic result. For the treatment of the LED, we used our IVUS data with sync vision in order to plan our stent placement. Knowing that the distal vessel was over two millimeters and the proximal vessel was three millimeters, we were able to use sync vision to plan our stent placement. Since the longest 225 stent that we had available was 30 millimeters, we used the sync vision to plan where the proximal portion of the stent would land. We then measured the length that was necessary to cover the LED from the ostium to where the proximal portion of the distal stent would land. We then decided to use the longest 3 millimeter stent to cover the proximal LED from the ostium distally. And after making this measurement, realized that a 30 millimeter stent placed between the proximal and distal stents would allow for a small degree of overlap between the stents and would allow us to cover the entire vessel. So following this plan, we deployed the stents from distal to proximal and performed post-dilation with a 3.0 non-compliant balloon across the proximal and mid-vessel stent up to 16 atmospheres. Repeat intravascular ultrasound showed under-expansion of the distal stent, and this was dilated with a 2.5 by 15 millimeter non-compliant balloon up to 20 atmospheres. The post-stent IVUS assessment is shown here. Distally, there is no significant plaque distal to our most distal stent with no uh, edge dissection noted. The stents are well opposed to the vessel wall in both the distal, mid, and proximal stent. The proximal stent shows no dissection, and the ostium of the LED is patent 
with no impingement of the left main from our proximal stent. The minimum stent area measured in our distal, mid, and proximal stents are adequate for 2.25, 2.5, and 3.0 stents. Still images taken both pre and post stent from our IVUS runs are shown here. In the proximal LED, we see the concentric, mildly calcified plaque before stenting with a well expanded 3 millimeter stent. In the mid vessel, we again see the fibrotic concentric plaque uh, prior to stenting with a well expanded 2.5 millimeter stent. And in the distal vessel, we see the calcified eccentric stenosis with a well-expanded stent after high-pressure non-compliant balloon expansion. Our final angiographic results showed a well-expanded stent along the entire vessel. There is no angiographic dissection proximally or distally. And interestingly, there is an excellent myocardial blush in the septum with uh, preserved septal perforating branches. In this complicated case, intravascular ultrasound allowed me to make several key decisions that facilitated treatment of the uh, LED. The first was assessment of the distal vessel size, which was poorly visualized angiographically and was clearly adequate for placement of a 2.25 millimeter stent, uh, making the intervention feasible. The ability to plan the intervention by choosing stent lengths based upon sink vision allowed us to adequately cover the entire LED back to the ostium. Post stent deployment, Iva showed us the under expansion of the distal stent which was then treated with high pressure non-compliant balloon dilation with excellent result. It also showed us that we had adequately post dilated the more proximal stents with the 3 millimeter non-compliant balloon without causing a proximal dissection or encroachment on the left main. So with the use of intravascular ultrasound on the LED, we were able to perform complete revascularization of both lesions that were causing the ischemia on the stress test and the patient's class 3 angina. How do we face the clinical challenge of diffuse lung lesions? With higher event rates, more uncertainty, with regard to stent placement angiographically and optimizing stent diameters over long segments of the vessels. Intravascular ultrasound can assist in pre-stent planning, allowing us to choose stent sizes and lengths that will cover the entire extent of the significant disease while providing optimal stent expansion and minimizing stent edge effects which may in the long run lead to lower event rates and improved treatment of angina. In conclusion, angina after surgical or percutaneous revascularization is common and may be due to disease progression or stent or graft failure. Complete revascularization is often a challenge and intravascular ultrasound may facilitate treatment of diffusely diseased vessels, taking the guesswork out of choice of stent length and diameter. Co-registration with sync vision or a process of bookmark and simultaneous angiography may improve your ability to optimize stent placement and avoid geographic miss. Post-stent evaluation for complete expansion and a systematic assessment of minimal stent area gives an objective measure for completion of the procedure. By way of follow-up, at eight months post-intervention, the patient described in this presentation is angina-free.